This is Design Safe Radio, where natural hazards researchers strive to make our society more resilient to everything nature throws at us. Hello and welcome to another episode of Design Safe Radio. I'm your host, Dan Zayner. Happy to be with you once again. And today we have joining us from the balmy University of Florida, Jeremy Waysom. Great to, great to meet you. Welcome. Thanks. It's nice to be here. Um, so before we get into our, our topics for today, uh, can you give us a little bit of background of who you are, where you're from, what's your specialty, and uh, then we'll get get right into it. Yeah, Jeremy Waysom, I did all of my degrees at the University of Florida in civil engineering, and actually my research has nothing to do with what <laughs> I'm actually working on now with the NERI project, but um, I did asphalt research as a PhD student. Wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure how I ended up with the asphalt space, but eventually kind of realized it wasn't where I wanted to be. And so I did a little... You wanted stint. to go on a road less traveled, so to speak? Uh -huh. There yeah, we go, there I it did. is. I did. there it is. <laughs> um, I, I ended up doing a postdoc in computer science, actually. Wow. And I know. I'm a strange bird, so we'll, we'll get there eventually how I got into this work, but... Yeah, I, I was there and doing work on what's referred to by the National Science Foundation as broadening participation in computing. And I managed a multi-institutional alliance grant that focused on that. So it kind of opened my eyes to um, the field of engineering and computer science education as a career path. And I just started learning more about that. I did another shorter postdoc in engineering education and said, this is it. This is where I want to be. Um, and so I actually took an instructional position with the hopes that one day I would be able to be an assistant professor and here I am. So cool. somehow navigated all of that. And because of my relationship with some of the faculty in civil engineering, I was invited to work on uh, our renewal for our NARI grant. And they wanted to expand the education and outreach portion of their proposal. And I was invited to work on that. That's awesome. And mm -hmm. th that facility and that whole team down there is just so cool and really, really fun to work with. Can you kind of give us a picture of what engineering education as a field is like and, and how does that relate to natural hazards, to wind engineering? Like, what are some of the challenges there? Who are some of the students that you're um, designing your instructional uh, pieces towards? Can you tell us about some of that? Yeah. So engineering education broadly speaking, is centered around like the effective instruction and practice of engineering. So how do we train and equip the next generation of engineers? And how do we support the people who are already professionals in this space? And, mm. um, and in general, engineering impacts everything that we do, right? You know, if you look around where you are, there's engineering, it's it's a ubiquitous thing. And so we work towards solutions that will improve how we educate engineers through innovative techniques, through transformative ideas, whether that be inside or outside of the classroom. So this includes research, right? And uh, when I think about like what NERI does and the infrastructure that NERI has in terms of introducing, you know, scientists to technologies that they otherwise wouldn't have access to um, there is a huge opportunity to introduce people who don't really have the technical savvy that an engineer might to what's actually going on, what's being designed around them. Like why are roofs built the way that they're built? Why are walls the way that they're structured? Um, and I think having a better understanding of the built environment is really valuable for kids, for parents. Um, oh for, yeah. For anyone. Um, and if you think about like the state of Florida in particular, we're very susceptible to wind hazards. Most people are aware that hurricanes are a thing here. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. And it actually, it actually scares people from moving to our state because they're afraid of like the idea of a giant storm like a hurricane. Um, and I think through education, it'll help people understand like, we're not just putting you in a house or building a structure that's going to be susceptible to this type of hazard. Like we're actually thinking um, in great detail how to improve structural design mm -hmm. 
um, from any aspect of your home, like the windows, the doors, the roof, the materials that are used. So all of that, I think, is really great to like kind of segue students into the space of engineering because they're tangible things they can see and understand. Yeah, this is really important, especially in engineering education. Like my my background is mechanical engineering. And one of the things that I constantly got feedback on when I got out into industry was you don't actually know anything about real things, do you? Like, you know, all this theory. <laughs> You get, you know how to do calculations, but you don't know how to weld a pipe together. You don't, you've yeah. never. So it sounds like a lot of what you're doing is like, here is how to make it real. Like when yeah. you go to buy a house in Florida, here's the things that you need to consider at, right. from an engineering perspective and have been considered from an engineering perspective. Yeah. Is there, is there anything like on the non-technical side of things that you're working with students that are like, Again, referring just my own anecdotal experience, we focused a whole lot on the theoretical technical things, but not so mm -hmm. much the, how do you actually work with other engineers? How do you work within yeah. a organization? Do you guys touch on that as well? A little bit. So, um, you know, for me personally, as a black female, like I get to be a role model yeah. for people who don't really think of me when they think of what an engineer is, right? Um, and I think that in and of itself is a really valuable learning experience for students. Um, our uh, lead investigator, Jennifer Bridge, also amazing. Woman. Yeah. And for me, like being able to see her and her role uh, as a as a student was really exciting because as a graduate student, you know, she's living a life and pursuing her career goals. She has a young child and I had a young child and I was like, this is really cool to see her leading yeah. such a large effort. So I, I appreciate having her as an example. And I think bringing them into the classroom and showing people like, this is our team. This is the diversity of our, our group. And look at the students who are involved in the project. Like even that piece of role modeling um, is really valuable. And we're really intentional about from the undergraduate students on the way to the staff in the in the building, like thinking about who's involved in the project and and what they represent. Mm. So that's one thing that we do talk about with the students for sure. That's really great. Yeah, ex exploring kind of our own our own biases as well. It sounds like mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and how that affects the way we work together or don't. <laughs> yeah, and I, I I do think like there's room for that. Um, so you know, in our structure for our our program that we designed, we do talk about teamwork and the importance of like diverse teams and all of that. So that That's is awesome. a piece of what we do. Um, what's kind of segueing into our next thing? That's really a really good, good transition here. Like, so what's, what's something that everyone should know about engineering education? You talked about that a little bit, but let's be more, more explicit about it. And especially, are there any misconceptions? Like, I know uh, in some of the circles that I run in, there's a lot of loud voices saying, eh, don't go to college, engineering education, you know, it's, it's kind of useless <laughs> unless you know exactly what you want to do. And that's great if you want to be a PhD or something. But we know there are a lot more valuable things about an engineering education, even if you don't end up doing engineering later. Like, oh, yeah. I don't do any engineering these days, but I'm very thankful I've got a degree in mechanical engineering. <laughs> yeah. No, I... I... I wholeheartedly agree with that sentiment. So one of the things that I think is the biggest misconception is the fact that like going to college is for everyone. I would agree that it's not for everyone. Um, and so I think people need to understand like you will come away from an engineering degree with skills that are very transferable that can allow you to do anything. Um, that's our goal is that like people come away with the ability to solve problems. But for us, it's, you know, engineers solve problems for people. Like that's the main thing that we want our students to walk away with. And so what skills do you need to be able to think about individuals, their needs, and be able to design things to help solve these great, enormous problems that we have um, in our world. And so to do that, we need a diverse workforce. Mm -hmm. And the way that we've gone about 
introducing engineering concepts to students these days hasn't really produced that, right? Like we are pretty far behind um, in terms of like just production of engineers uh, for the jobs and the needs that we have in this country. And so how do we make a more diverse workforce? How do we figure out how to include more people um, and give access to people at different levels? That's our job as engineering educators to try to figure out. Yeah. Um, and that might look like you going to a brick and mortar institution and getting that engineering degree, but it might look totally different for some other people. So, you know, there's been the exploration of um, like massive online uh, programs that you can pursue. Uh, there's credentialing that you could get through different like online certificate programs. Um, so yeah, people are pursuing different pathways to engineering. I do still think there's a lot of value in a, in a college degree, but it depends on you as the individual what that looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and we're not, most of us, we're not, <laughs> we're not just, you know, solely touting, like, come to the university so that we can take all of your money. Like, no, we want people to learn and grow and, you know, have that human element that I think is missing from the online experience. Because mm -hmm. engineers, we don't work in silos like people think we do. Like, we work on really diverse teams. So, I might be a civil engineer on a project, but there's probably an electrical engineer. There's probably a mechanical engineer. There's likely someone in like project management and planning. There's somebody who's good with the numbers and the financial side of things. If I make a product, there's an entire group of people focused on advertising and describing and selling that product. Mm -hmm. um, and, and people all of building them, it and supplying the right. And they need to for be able it. to communicate with each other and have a level of competency in the space. And if you don't ever interact with other people, it's really hard to understand how to do that well. Those transferable skills that I'm mentioning. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I I think that's the misconception is that you know people don't realize it's more than just take some classes and get a piece of paper it's navigating those relationships and yeah. the communication skills and the professional skills that you need to be successful as well. Especially at a large university. Um, I mean, had I had like, again, anecdotally here, had I gone and gotten a mechanical engineering degree online, still would have gotten the same degree, may have ended up working at the same place that I did, but never would have been able to get into the marching band at University of Illinois. Wouldn't have met mm -hmm. my wife, had our amazing three kids, all that thing. Like, yeah wouldn't have met people from all over the world who yep. we still keep in touch with and have helped shape that diversity of that experience that you're talking about to be able mm -hmm. to relate to, you know, the guy from the Northeast who's been a welder for 50 years and also the lady from Japan who's, you know, working on automotive engineering and everybody in between. Yeah, I, I as someone with a PhD, like, at the graduate student level, you meet so many people from across the world. And a lot of people go back to the countries that they originally came from or to new places. And your network grows far beyond the reaches of like our country um, and the work that we do. And engineering does that as well, right? Like we are not just designing things that only impact us here or locally. Like anything that we build has global implications because of supply chain, because of the environment. Mm -hmm. There's so much that I think we underestimate about what we do as engineers and the impacts that it has on, on other people's lives. Um, and the more that we get to interact with other people, the more compassionate we are, the more um, empathetic we are, the better we can relate to one another. And I think it helps us ultimately in the end design a better world yeah i'll put that on a t-shirt <laughs> <laughs> so um getting into talking about the the facility that you're currently at down at, at uf down in gainesville so part of that neary facility i mean we've you've talked about it a, a bit just this massive wind tunnel this world-class facility how do you incorporate things like the boundary layer wind tunnel into curricula for engineers? Like, we'd just love to hear some stories about that. Yeah, so 
first of all, I have to thank Forrest Masters and Jennifer Bridge and Kurt Gurley, um, Brian Phillips, all of them for being willing to bring me on to this project. Um, it was just an email out of out of nowhere for me, seemingly, <laughs> but apparently they've been talking about it for a while. Um, and it was really just how do you how do you come up with something that will introduce people to what we do in the facility, but in a meaningful way. And we've done a lot of outreach through that facility already, um, but nothing that was really being measured. And mm. it was kind of like, oh, you can come and see the facility. And then the other things that are like expected of a NERI grant, which is like introduce potential users, right, to the facility yeah. and help them think about how they could incorporate it into their research. Um, so I was like, what about designing something for some high school kids? Like, how do we, how do we do that meaningfully? And they said, oh, whatever you want to do, figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, yeah, we, we decided we were going to help create like this teacher professional development experience in the summer where we would select um, up to 10 teachers to come and learn about the engineering design process about inquiry about uh, like learner center teaching mm. um, and even talking about things that are traditionally not really talked about like teamwork science communication presentation skills um, and have them go through kind of that curriculum to help them integrate a project-based learning activity into their classroom through the academic year. Cool. And, and we left it kind of open to them to decide what project they would integrate into their classes because um, engineering isn't a class at a lot of high schools in the state. So um, we focused our efforts on Title I schools as well. So these are the mm, under-resourced yeah. schools that don't really have access to um, a lot of facilities and individuals who have the skill set in engineering. And so we're trying to kind of upskill them in that space. That's great. So, yeah, I, I was excited about it. And in our first year, we really worked on the structure of that curriculum design uh, and we also partnered with a program that exists at the University of Florida called Scientists in Every Florida School, which is out of the Florida Museum of Natural History. They have cool. a, uh, an institute called the uh, Thompson Earth Systems Institute. And their program connects science role models in K-12 classrooms to introduce them to like cutting edge research. So uh, Kurt Gurley and I, visited a few classrooms and connected with some teachers and one of them kind of came on board to help us design this curriculum and so she helped me identify different projects that would relate to the type of uh, wind hazards that we are able to test in the facility and oh so, cool yeah it was a lot of work for her because not only did she find the projects but then she connected them to state standards oh wow that were, you know, re they're required to teach as science mm -hmm. teachers, you know, we don't want them to have to do something that's going to add more work to their lives. Right? Yeah, they, they've got plenty. They have plenty of things to do and they don't have the resources to really do it. Right? No. Um, and so how do we ensure that what we're doing doesn't add an additional burden, mm -hmm. but also give students new and exciting ways to engage with engineering. And so we brought in, we had six teachers this summer um, from all over the state, from down in the like most Southern part of Florida to the most Western part of Florida <laughs> um, in a different time zone in Florida. So yeah, we, we had a really good variety of teachers and some of them are going to be designing tipping towers that will sit in the tunnel and you know will ramp up the wind until they tip over um, mm. be able to iterate on their designs. Um, others will be looking at things like sail cars and how do oh, you design, cool. yeah, how do you design a car that the sail is pushed by the wind, whose goes the furthest, the fastest type of thing. Um, and others are thinking of different designs that they could create. Um, so it's just all sorts of 
different concepts that they're going to integrate into the class into their classroom. That's great. Um, we've actually done this with that program I mentioned with elementary school kids and high school kids and the elementary school kids projects with the tipping towers were phenomenal. Oh, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> um, in my opinion, they were better than a lot of the high school is designed. <laughs> and I don't have an explanation for it, but I think it's because, you know, they're not in their heads about stuff, right? Yeah. Like, I think the older we get, the harder it is to kind of get out of our own way. Um, so the kids are like, I had this many sticks, so I used that many sticks. And <laughs> <laughs> I liked the glue, so I used the glue, that kind of thing. Um, but the high schoolers were overthinking it, I think. Mm -hmm. That's so, always yeah. a good lesson of when, when you're overthinking things. Mm -hmm. um, one of the teachers we worked with was even an, an arts teacher. He, mm. he teaches art, but uh, also taught engineering. And so their projects were not only uh, required to meet certain standards, certain design constraints, um, but they were also required to look, have a certain aesthetic, mm -hmm. right? So I was going to ask if you incorporated arts in that. I was thinking, like, how cool would it be if somebody designed a building that also worked as, like, pan pipes or something? Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. produce a different frequency at different wind yeah. speeds. Or That would be really cool. I'm going to add that to our list of things to investigate. Because, <laughs> I mean, it's it's how do we get people excited about the wind and then we can tell them like why we actually do what we do in that wind tunnel yeah um, it's really impressive to see and you know we try to invite them as much as possible to come and tour the facility as well um and the ones that can't come we produce videos mm -hmm. of their competitions and send them to them and some of the teachers have like days where they just watch the videos and have popcorn and awesome. the kids yell at each other about like who's <laughs> gonna do better all of that so it's a really fun project um for me on the research side i'm looking at the teacher self-efficacy like do they believe in their ability to incorporate mm. these really technical concepts into their classroom because it isn't really a trivial task to ask them to change their curriculum and incorporate something that they weren't trained to do necessarily. Especially if they've been doing it for a decade or two. Right. So we look at that over time and then hopefully we'll see that their self-efficacy improves. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a whole lot more to talk about when we're on a recording. <laughs> <laughs> But marin marinate upon this. I don't know if you're if you're following on the earthquake engineering side of things, but we had a conference um, out in Salt Lake City where they brought in undergraduate students who designed uh, towers with a certain design criteria, and they had a seismic design competition where they had a shake table at the front of the room and they shook it all over the place with ground motions they were given ahead of time. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, that would be really cool to do a wind engineering thing. Yeah, it would. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we can talk about that more as well. Yeah, no, one of one of the conversations we had with a teacher was about uh like erosion. Ooh. And like, you know, could we design something that would push a beach, like a a fake sand situation? Like how would we work on that? Um, so you know, that's the stuff that we can give to students and say, like, figure it out, you know, and by mm -hmm. students I mean like our undergraduate or graduate students, like think through what would we need to design to ensure that, you know, we could capture that kind of information. Yeah. Which gets us to our next topic here about those undergraduates that you have at, at UF. So we have uh, the research experience for undergraduates at all of the NARI facilities. UF is uh, among the, those. And so like, what has been your experience with those REU students and, and what do you hope they take away from the, the summer they spend at the UF facility? Yeah. Um, so we've had, I guess, two cohorts now of students while I've been involved in the project. Um, the first group, I didn't really get to connect with as much because I was working with the teacher, but I did have one of them help us look through projects. So that was kind of fun um, and talk to them about the purpose of what we were trying to do. 
this summer, um, I've had the pleasure of interacting with all of our REU students. We have three right now. Um, and they participated in our um, summer professional development and even gave a talk about their research and their experience as high school students to the teachers to talk about like the importance of this type of engagement, um, working in a project-based learning type of environment. So I think it's more compelling for them to tell of their experience than it might be for me, who's like well beyond a decade removed from <laughs> <laughs> yeah. high school. Um, and one of them actually specifically chose our site for the opportunity to engage with engineering education. Wow. So I'm really excited about working with her and we've been talking pretty consistently throughout the summer um, about the project that I'm working on. And she's been connected with some other engineering education faculty at the University of Florida. And she'll be uh, attending, we have a like a combined research group discussion that's going on this summer. So she's attending that here shortly and we'll get some more insight on like types of projects that happen in engineering education because it's kind of a new department on a lot of campuses, students don't really know what it is. Mm -hmm. um, they have ideas about, you know, what it could be, but giving them actual like tangible things that are, people are doing is really helpful to allow them to understand like, oh, this is what I can potentially pursue. Um, and as someone who got a PhD in engineering, and then made the choice to move into engineering education after I was done. I think having a better understanding before I jumped into a PhD program might have pushed me a different way for my PhD. Um, so I'm excited to give her the chance to make that decision early. And I, I think she's been thinking about it like as an opportunity. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I, thinking too of just the, that experience as an undergrad like what a, what an opportunity to get that diverse exposure and experience like we've been talking about this whole time of just the world-class facility and world-class mm -hmm. people at that facility like you i'll say that so you don't have to <laughs> <laughs> you know and getting to be around you guys for a summer I, what an amazing opportunity for an undergraduate that yeah will absolutely have you know can't quantify necessarily maybe that that effect but there is an effect um yeah, i'm sure really someone cool. has done that research so yes <laughs> someone probably has <laughs> or if they haven't you've got a you got a ready-made research project ready to go yeah i think so you know my research really focuses on mentoring and one of the things that i love about reu programs is that you're giving students a lot of engagements where they can develop mentoring relationships. So they have peers in their cohort, not just at their site, but you know, at all of the NARI facilities that they're connected to. They have near peers through the graduate students who are involved in those projects. They have kind of some aspirational potential mentors that they could connect with who are doing incredible work, as you mentioned, in these facilities. And all of their networks are now their network. Yeah. And as, I didn't get that level of integration in a project. I think these projects are so thoughtfully curated for the students and even from the professional development side, they're getting the skills that they need to be successful moving forward if they choose the path of research. So it's, it's a phenomenal experience for them, really enriching and I just, I wish I had the chance to do something like this as a student. Yeah. I, I feel like if I had had an opportunity, I wouldn't have taken advantage of it when I was a student. Like, <laughs> I'm sure it was available, but I was just like, nah, but. You were doing marching band, right? Exactly. Yeah. I, was, I, was, I was focused on other things, <laughs> um, which turned out great. So, you know, no mm -hmm. regrets, but mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's really fantastic to see that, that opportunity and, and like the stellar human beings who go through it like every every chance i've gotten to meet an ru student's like wow you are so awesome <laughs> yeah and and so you know the idea that all of them are going to go on and be like 
PhDs at research institutions and do all this stuff like is probably unrealistic, but giving them the opportunity to make that choice and it be an informed choice rather than a, mm-hmm. I didn't even know that was an op- op- option for me. Like, I think that is what's invaluable yeah. um, for the project. Especially finding it, the, there is very much intentionally a focus on, you know, under-resourced, historically mm-hmm. marginalized communities in the university setting yeah. and many are used students are coming from there. Can you tell a little bit about some of their experience and what they've found? Of, of, wow, I didn't even know this was available to me. Yeah, and, and I'll just say the student who the, who I mentioned earlier, who I've been working with, she's from the University of Puerto Rico, Mayaguez. And the two individuals that I connected her with are faculty who graduated from that university who do engineering education research. Awesome. And I don't think she knew that that was even a possibility, right? Like having a connection with someone who's from where you're from, who's gone to the school that you went to and now has a career in academia. Um, And I'm sure that there are those anecdotes across the country where faculty are saying, oh, you're interested in this? I can connect you with this person who does what you're doing. And that's not to say like it will result in like some meaningful relationship long term, but it gives them an an, a role model, somebody they can Mm -hmm. see who looks like them, who's been through what they've been through, and can relate to them at a level that you know I can't Mm because I've not come from that space. Yeah. Um, Even though we're both women, I don't know what it's like to live in Puerto Rico and go to school there. Right pursue an engineering degree and be interested in engineering education. Like all of those things are not my life. So yeah, <laughs> it's good to have someone you don't have to navigate those barriers with. You yeah. can just talk about your experience and it, it it's communal. Um, and from like a, a mentoring side, like there's evidence that shows that um, that type of relationship does produce better outcomes for their mentoring relationship. So That's my hope is that that will occur. And I think, uh, I think it's moving in the right direction. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Um, for a wrap of your, you, you mentioned um, a bit about giving kind of voices and to, mm-hmm. you know, those who typically haven't had it and telling good, good stories and helping navigate those barriers. And it sounds like you do that through your own podcast, Modern <laughs> Figures, which I've got to stick on my Stitcher feed to listen to, oh, um, about black, black women in commu- computing. Can, can you tell us about that? You're in your third season already, which is fantastic. Like you're kind of over the hump of, you know, where a lot of podcasts die off. So I well know. done. Honestly, like I'm probably the more reluctant of the two of us uh, to have gotten there (laughs) because it's, it's a lot of work. um, It is a whole lot of work. (laughs) To maintain a podcast and to interview people and just vetting people to make sure like the content will be the type of content that we want to reach people. But I mean, it, it came out of this need that we saw that there weren't role models for people in computing to look at. Like there was this whole movement around hidden figures, that movie that came out about the NASA computers. Um, And, you know, those women are incredible trailblazers for the field of computing. And we didn't even know about them as a country until a movie came out, which is absurd. Um, Yeah without their experiences we wouldn't have done so much of what we've done Mm -hmm. in space right and i think about the people who i've met along my journey and the incredible work that they're doing that kind of sits hidden somewhere in an academic journal repository (laughs) that nobody's gonna read and you know, their stories of how they came to be successful and what they're doing. And it kind of just makes sense to highlight some of that work being done from people who are around today and are still doing that work that we have access to and can talk to. And so that's kind of where it came from. And 
we're going to keep doing it as much as we can to try to, you know, help people understand that you could come from anywhere. Your experiences could be super varied, but you can still make a contribution in a technical space um, that changes the world. So yeah, that's what we're doing. <sighs> that's fantastic. Um, where can people follow along with your, your podcasts and other things that you're up to research wise? We're pretty much everywhere. So <laughs> if you just look up Modern Figures, you'll find it, um, Modern Figures Podcast. Um, and for me, like I'm on Twitter, so it's probably easiest just to find me. And it's just at Jeremy Waysom. It's been pretty easy to find. Um, and then I'll connect you to like my website and all the things. Awesome. Man, mm -hmm. it, is, it has just been wonderful to meet you today. I'm hoping that we get to chat a whole lot more. Yeah. And I think we've got a lot, a lot of things to talk about. So uh, just very grateful that you took time today. I know you've got a ton going on and getting ready for the semester coming up in a very short amount of time um, and all that. So I just really appreciate it. And everything that you're up to down there at UF is just fantastic. Well, I'm glad that this is something that people have access to. And I think, you know, the more we talk about what we do to people who are beyond, you know, academic spaces, the better um, we have, better chance we have at getting more people exposed to what's going on, what they can engage in and research and, you know, potentially career paths that they could follow too. So yeah, for sure. Thanks so much. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Take All care. Right. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Design Safe Radio. This show is sponsored by the National Science Foundation, grant number 2129782. You can subscribe to Design Safe Radio on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you find your podcasts. Please leave us a review so that we can improve the show and also help others find our episodes in iTunes. Thanks for your feedback and support. We really appreciate it. You can find out more about NARI at designsafe-ci.org on Facebook at Design Safe Radio or on Twitter at Nary Design Safe.